presentation, an overview of uh, all of the chapters in the book. Uh, the second symposium was about one of those chapters. It featured a focus on Latin American cities uh, and what they're doing uh, that we can learn from. This uh, symposium is about two success, success stories, one in Oakland and one in Los Angeles. Two great stories that we can learn a lot from. Um, uh, the uh, Sunset for All project is uh, an example of in Los Angeles car culture, really effective and and comprehensive community organizing, touching on a lot of concerns and a lot of issues, managed to get a lot of support and uh, dare I say, knocking on wood, uh, leading to uh, what's bound to be a successful campaign to take uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard and put in a protected bike lane on its entire length in the Eastern portion of it. Super exciting and a lot to learn from there. In Oakland, Telegraph Avenue is a, a bike lane project, a protected bike lane project through the Koreatown and Uptown neighborhood that was almost reversed due to a decision by the Oakland Department of Transportation to <coughs> respond to a lot of complaints that the, uh, that the protected bike lanes weren't working as intended. And uh, bike and that, that was the first time I personally, yes, this is, that's my neighborhood, that's my street. And that's the first time that I personally did any door-to-door -door, uh, canvassing and any real uh, local grassroots organizing for a bike project in a long time. And it was fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, uh, getting uh, on the sidewalks and talking to people. And Bike East Bay, uh, under Dave Campbell's uh, leadership, made it easy to do and made me feel like uh, my little contribution was part of a big picture that was gonna make a difference. And it worked, we made a difference, even though the Oakland DOT said they were gonna uh, reverse it, uh, the city council overruled them. And Dave, I won't say anything more, sorry to uh, um, <clears throat> take your introduction there. Um, and, and with that, I want to finish with a reminder about the California Bicycle Summit. That book that I referred to is available to everyone who comes to the summit. So we buy a ticket, get the book. Really uh, excited to be able to spread that book uh, uh, out there. And, and in fact, I'll go ahead and say right now that if you know of a policy maker or a decision maker, an influential person who needs that um, book, um, just let us know and we'll send it to them for free. Really generous donation that allows us to do that. So um, let us let us know. Um, the, Calif and not, the California Bicycle Summit is April 6th through the 9th. I'm going to let you all, I'm going to give you all a little bit of a sneak peek into the, um, into the agenda, what that's going to look like. Go away. <laughs> the schedule at a glance is what I'm looking for. Uh, it opens on Wednesday, April 6th with a reception and a little marketplace where uh, we can support uh, local bike oriented business people. We'll have bike tours and then a uh, really exciting movie night uh, at the Parkway Theater. The main content is going to be on Thursday and Friday. It starts with an opening plenary. The California Secretary of Transportation will be there. That's Tokes Omishakin. The mayor of Oakland will be there. Uh, we're likely to see the chair of the Assembly Transportation Committee, Assemblymember Laura Friedman there. The executive director of Bike East Bay, Ginger Jui, will be there to welcome us. It, and we're going to have not just the normal speeches, uh, Mr. Omishakin from 
uh, the secretary from the Department of from, from the Transportation, uh, the California State Transportation Agency. Uh, he will uh, make a speech, but he said he likes to have ad hoc spontaneous conversation, which was great news to us because that's exactly what we want to do. So we're going to have a, a panel discussion with those people I just mentioned to, to talk about uh, uh, you know, what's exciting to us and what they can do to make our cities more bike friendly. Uh, we can ask them some challenging questions and see how they respond on the dot. So that thurs that's Thursday and Friday. Um, Friday night will end with uh, the East Bay Bike Party. The East Bay Bike Party is a monthly gala, a rolling gala, uh, hundreds of people on bikes. It's informal. They always have dance parties. Uh, we always have a dance party at the California Bicycle Summit this year. That dance party is going to be uh, a part of the East Bay Bike Party. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and then finally on Saturday, we're going to have some more bike tours. Um, and I've talked too long. This is way too important of a session for me to have talked this long. Uh, thank you so much for uh, paying attention. You will want to hear this one last detail, though, and that is that everybody who is here at this session today can get a discounted ticket to the summit uh, at the early bird price, which has already expired, but not for you. Normally, it'll be $425. We're uh, making the tickets available for $295. Uh, until midnight tonight. And thank you, Stephanie, for putting the discount code in the chat. Uh, use that discount code and reserve your spot at the California Bicycle Summit. And with that, we are going to roll right into the presentation. I want to thank very much the folks from the LA County Bicycle Coalition and Bike East Bay for being here. From uh, the LA County Bicycle Coalition, uh, their executive De director, Eli Akira Kaufman, and uh, Kevin Shin will uh, talk about what the LACBC's role and then the community leaders of this project, uh, Avital Shavit, Terrence Houston, and Derek Paul are here to talk about uh, the Sunset for All project. Um, and then we're going to hear from uh, Bike East Bay to talk about Telegraph. We're going to take questions after both presentations. You can ask clarifying questions in the chat, but we're going to uh, have uh, verbal questions and conversation after both presentations. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask Kevin, our amazing, uh, very able tech support and development associate, Kevin Claxton, to uh, pass us off to the LACBC. Um, so, Kevin, take it away. Uh, he, he's muted. Yeah, maybe uh, the Eli, you should have the ability to uh, share your screen if you're planning to do that. Um, no, can you hear me? Right okay. Ahead. Yeah, I'll dive in. So I'll just say that, uh, <clears throat> Kevin, as you try to figure out your your uh, your sound, um, maybe I'll just quickly say Kevin Claxton uh, is a former employee of LACBC and a total uh, advocate and, and partner to, to the work that we've done locally in LA. And we love Kevin Claxton and the other Kevin Shin actually got pulled away on a, a pressing call that he had to really take on behalf of the org. So I just put that in the chat, but I'm happy to introduce myself and, uh, and then and kick it off to, uh, to Derek or to Terrence and Avital who will then kick it off to, uh, to Derek. So. Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Eli Kier Kaufman. I'm the executive director of the LA County Bicycle Coalition. And uh, it's nice to speak to a, a community that uh, doesn't need too much of an introduction, but I'll still share that, um, you know, our aim is to improve the quality of life for everyone in LA by advocating for a safe, equitable, and joyous region to bicycle. 
you know, for us, making LA more bikeable will improve everyone's quality of life uh, because we believe that bicycle itself is a vehicle for progress that is accessible, healthy, affordable, sustainable, and fun. Um, so that's why LACBC is so thrilled to serve as the fiscal sponsor and thought partner to Sunset for All, uh, which is, as you'll find out, a, an amazing community-led active transportation project that's going to transform uh, one of LA's most iconic streets from a, a car thoroughfare uh, into a, uh, a destination for, for walkers, for transit users, for bicyclists, and for drivers to get where they need to go um, uh, with ease and safely. Um, you know, our long-term goal and why LACBC is really invested in this project is to develop a street advocacy playbook and training series that will empower other local neighborhood leaders to develop uh, the next active transportation projects uh, ready to democratize the design, implementation, and stewardship of LA streets. Um, so I think with that, uh, I'm here to answer any questions in terms of our role um, at the end of the presentation um, and in the Q&A. But uh, mostly, we're just honored to be a part of this. Um, and I think you're going to be excited by the community leadership and thoughtfulness of this group. Um, and uh, it'll become very clear why LACBC had to be uh, uh, a major support and in any way we could. So um, I guess with that, I'll kick it over to Terrence and Avital to introduce themselves and set the stage for Derek. Thanks, everyone. Hi. Um... I'm not sure if I'm on screen yet, but I'm Terrence Houston, and um, I'm from Sunset for All, and I'm going to hand it on off to Avi Tall since Derek's going to give the presentation. I'll see you for the talk back. And hi, everyone. I'm Avi Tal Shavit, and I'm with Sunset for All, and, you know, really excited to hear, have you guys hear this story. Um, I got involved with Sunset for All when I got hit uh, by a car riding my bike on an uh, unprotected bike lane that exists on Sunset Boulevard today. I was heading to work um, from Hollywood to downtown LA. And so this project really is for, for everyone to be able to have a place where they feel safe and protected to bike to the store, to work, uh, to get some ice cream and to have a more livable community and neighborhood. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague on this project, uh, Derek. Derek, take it away. All right, guys, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Cool. All right, uh, so I'll be talking about Sunset for All. Um, it's a you know, grassroots group that formed out of the LACBC's Neighborhood Ambassador Program. Uh, and we all basically had experience uh, biking in LA, um, which kind of gave us a perspective, you know, um, how difficult it can be to navigate our city streets um, on a bike. Uh, and so we all sort of converged on, you know, wanting to organize to make Sunset Boulevard a better place to walk, to bike, to drive, to shop, or to dine, you know, all these elements that make a main street the center of the community. Um, so I'll be talking about why Sunset for All is important and what makes this campaign somewhat unique, um, including some really great lessons that we've learned from crowdfunding for safe streets. Um, so here's a picture of a pretty, um, you know, prominent section of Sunset Boulevard. Um, it's a pretty wide road. Um, you know, about 40,000 cars pass through uh, Sunset Boulevard on an average day. Um, historically, it was a part of Route 66. Um, but you can also see it's not just an arterial, arterial road. Um, you know, it's also filled with businesses, uh, lots of pedestrian activity, people are biking. Um, there's restaurants and grocery stores and public schools along Sunset Boulevard. Um, so really, it is the main street of our neighborhoods. Um, unfortunately, you know, these two things coupled together, um, you know, a high activity, um, you know, but also this major road, um, it's kind of in conflict. Um, there's a high incident of injury on um, Sunset Boulevard. Um, and in the last 10 years alone, um, there's been a thousand injuries and deaths um, on just a 3.2 mile span of the street. Um, and so the street doesn't really work that well for anyone. Um, cars get stuck behind buses, but bikes are in conflict with parked cars. Um, it can be precarious across the street on foot. Um, and so what we want to do is kind of, you know, not just make it possible to, to use the street in this way, but make it safe and comfortable. 
Um, because if it's not safe and comfortable, then it's unlikely you're going to want to do it. Uh, in consultation with uh, some transportation professionals, um, we came up with a better vision. Um, you know, if we could just move the parking, uh, we could squeeze in um, these parking protected bike lanes onto the street um, that are bi-directional um, and provide a way for people who are not driving, who might be scootering, who might be bicycling, um, skateboarding, rollerblading, whatever it may be, um, a safe and comfortable way to travel the street. Um, it would also, you know, provide a buffer for pedestrians um, who are making use of the business, the businesses, um, you know, and, and just visiting um, uh, all the amenities on Sunset Boulevard. Um, this is something that should also be holistic. Um, so it should, it should also include, um, you know, crosswalks and bus stop upgrades and safe routes to schools and pedestrian amenities and pocket parks, um, all those elements that make a street more human, more catered towards a human scale. Uh, there would be regional implications to this as well. Um, if Sunset for All was, was implemented as proposed, um, it would provide 3.2 miles of a safe walking and biking trail for around 100,000 residents um, of the community. Um, and as you can see on the left, um, that red line is the, the Metro subway. Um, and so it would connect all these people of the city um, to the wider region um, of the county. Um, and we know that 50% of neighborhood trips are less than three miles, which is well within reasonable biking distance. Um, there's also some geographic, um, you know, obstacles here. Um, Sunset Boulevard is a mountain pass, basically. Um, and there's not really a viable parallel option um, if you want to get from downtown LA to, um, for example, any neighborhood north of Koreatown. Um, so that includes neighborhoods like Hollywood, East Hollywood, Los Feliz, Burbank, Eagle Rock, Pasadena. Um, if you want to get to downtown LA or, you know, the west side, this is the best way to do it. Um, and so Sunset Boulevard is really crucial if we hope to implement a calm, connected, safe bike, ne bike network in the city of LA. Um, and the city really agrees with this. Um, the city's bike plan calls for protected bike lanes on Sunset Boulevard. The city's mobility plan 2035 produced in 2015 calls for protected bike lanes on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, Metro, the city's transportation authority, has identified Sunset Boulevard as a priority for first mile to last mile active transportation. Um, and it's even on the city's Vision Zero high injury network, which is basically the 6% of city streets where 70% of severe pedestrian injuries and deaths occur. So everyone really agrees that this is a priority. Uh, Sunset for All has been organizing to turn this priority into reality. Uh, we've given dozens of presentations to local groups. We've gathered signatures at local schools, Ciclavia, farmers markets, and other community events. We worked to earn multiple letters of support, receiving them from local elementary schools. Um, we received one from Assemblywoman uh, Laura Friedman. Um, three local neighborhood councils have written unanimous letters of support. Um, you know, in more recent days uh, during the pandemic, we organized support for local businesses through our hashtag Bikes Mean Business campaign. Uh, which basically called on Sunset for All supporters to patronize small businesses on certain days. Um, more recently also, we started hosting monthly coffee walks um, to connect residents with local businesses to talk about Sunset for All. Um, so though we have a lot of support, uh, Sunset for All is not currently on the city's agenda. Um, and we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem, which many of you maybe can relate to. Um, so to implement Sunset for All, um, we need preliminary engineering to be done by the LA Department of Transportation. But council members must formally ask the, the LA DOT, um, the Department of Transportation, to create those plans. However, council members don't want to do this unless there's already overwhelming community support um, on the table. Um, but it's difficult to get this community support without the preliminary engineering because there's no details. The community doesn't know what they would be supporting. Um, and so we managed to um, overcome this obstacle in partnership with the LACBC um, by crowdfunding the cost of this crucial uh, you know, step in the process. Um, and here's basically what happened. Individual LACBC board members, board members pledged almost half of our goal as an angel donor match campaign. And this would be unlocked if we could raise the other half of the funds from the community. And we were able to do it. We raised $60,000 for the first leg of this process. And at the end of the day, 360 local donors donated to this match campaign and Super Pedestrian, a scooter ride share company, helped get us over the final bump. They even threw us a party to celebrate the milestone. 
And so with this funding, we were able to hire an engineering team. Um, this is Rock Miller and GTS Engineering. Um, and it's really shown us, you know, what a fruitful model crowdfunding um, this engineering could be for community organizing. Um, and there's been some unexpected implications from this. Um, this has really helped us with our business outreach um, because now we have 360 donors, you know, more than 360 donors um, who have donated to the campaign. And this is more of a tangible metric for community support than say a petition, for example. And so now, uh, you know, the Sunset for All proposal is not simply an idea, you know, that some community members have in their heads, but this is actually a plan that is materializing. Um, and beyond that, it's propelled by community support and initiative. Um, this has really shifted the power structure because now when we do our business outreach and we, we try to connect with you know, all the businesses on Sunset Boulevard, we're saying over 360 of your customers have donated to reimagine our community's main streets. We have an engineer, an engineer making plans. It's already happening. So you don't wanna miss out on this opportunity to be a part of the vision. Community groups that might've been lukewarm or skeptical, even of protected bike lanes, now they want to participate. And so we formed an advisory committee, which is basically um, helping oversee the engineering contract and collaborating with engineers to redesign the corridor. Um, and this has really helped us involve more community members. Um, it's brought residents, business owners, leaders of community orgs, school PTA moms, and a local council office into one room to, pr to produce a community-led vision for what Sunset for All could be. Um, and so we really feel like we have a lot of momentum going forward. Um, and, you know, a lot of consciousness has been raised. Um, and this has been reflected more recently um, in a city council uh, candidate debate. Uh, we have an election coming up. Um, Sun Several was mentioned in name and all candidates supported it, expressed their support. Um, the current council member praised Sunset for All as amazing and a model of successful community outreach. Um, and so our current campaign, you know, is really trying to focus on, um, you know, the business outreach as aspect of this. Um, and we have these, you know, beautiful materials that we've produced. Um, this is our brochure, um, which really illustrates how Sunset for All, as, as proposed, would integrate into the larger community. Um, it also emphasizes how this is about inclusivity, um, you know, making the center of our community, a main street for everyone, regardless of age, ability, or choice of mobility. Um, this is a window sticker that we're currently producing. Um, we're hoping that uh, businesses that are in support will display it um, and you know, maybe inspire other businesses to learn more about Sunset for All, um, maybe raise awareness um, amongst their customers, um, and really just raise the consciousness about this proposal um, in the larger community. Um, we really hope to inspire other communities, um, you know, learning from our successes and, you know, some of the obstacles that we've had to overcome. Um, just to, you know, hopefully they can see that their streets are not set in stone um, and that really, you know, people have agency over the environments in their neighborhoods. And so lastly, I'll leave you with this video of what biking in the city of LA could look like. Um, now, this is not Amsterdam or Copenhagen or New York City or Davis, California, any of those typical cities we think about when it comes to bicycling. Uh, bicycling. This is LA uh, during a Cyclovia event. Um, and it really shows that the demand for bicycling is there, but our infrastructure does not necessarily welcome people to do it. Um, and so um, at Sunset for All, we're really hoping to change that in the near future. Um, and thank you for listening. Thanks a lot. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, really excited to see Sunset Boulevard become a place that is safe so that Avital doesn't have to worry about getting hit anymore. Um, thank you, Derek, very much. Uh, next, we're going to move to Bike East Bay's Dave Campbell and Chris Wang, who is the board president of Walk Oakland, Bike Oakland. Those are uh, two of the organizational leaders and they can tell you a lot more about all the other leaders, people they brought in to score this important victory. Take it away. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, Dave Campbell, advocacy director with Bike East Bay, uh, joined by Chris Wang, uh, Walk Oakland, Bike Oakland to talk about Telegraph Ave. 
What Dave didn't, Dave Schneider didn't tell you is the Cal Bike Summit is going to be largely centered around insights that are on Telegraph Avenue right next to this project. So if you have some follow up questions or detailed questions you want to uh, learn more about, you may get the opportunity to actually experience them at the Cal Bike Summit on Telegraph Ave. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining us. If you want to say hello, I'll get the slides going. All right, while well, Chris gets un unmuted, uh, let's get started. This is Telegraph Avenue. It's a photo taken from downtown Oakland, kind of looking north towards Berkeley. And uh, based on the presentation from Derek that we just heard, I think Telegraph is a very similar street in width, perhaps also in you know intense activity on the street. But what you can see, what we, what the city of Oakland did here is this is the project shortly after it went in phase one, if you will. Telegraph was two lanes in each direction with a center turn lane, parking on either side and uh, no bike facilities. So they took out a travel lane and uh, made it a one lane in each direction street, keeping the center turn lane. And then the parking was moved out from the curb, protected bike lanes. And you can't quite see it here, but you'll see a slide soon. Bus boarding islands were put in uh, so the buses stay in the travel lane and uh, move along the street a little bit quicker. Uh, but this is it. And again, the Cal Bike Summit is largely centered on sites right around this street right here. And so this is phase one. This is a story. Uh, Chris, you can give me your perspective here. This is this. We're checking in on this story probably in chapter seven of maybe an eight or nine chapter story. Uh, we hope to get to the finish line on this later this year. Uh, Bike East Bay and Walk Oakland, Bike Oakland have worked on this project for many, 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 many years. But what you just saw a photo of and what you're seeing a photo here is it's kind of the end of phase one. Oakland repaved the street and put in the protected bike lanes uh, took out that travel lane, put in the, the bus boarding islands. And that was the result of a lot of outreach that we did to the businesses, working with the business district. We even had a couple of business owners who were so supportive of the project that they, they took our business petition and they took it around to 10 other businesses to get those 10 other businesses to support trying this out as a pilot project, if you will. And this was the first street safety change project that I've been involved in for 20 something years doing this, where the business district said, and their board of directors said, we wanna make this change. Uh, it's, it, it, was, it was somewhat of a struggling business district. It certainly is still struggling in the pandemic right now. And they're ready to try something new and different. And so the business district passed a resolution in support of this project. And this was back in 2015, 2016, when that happened. Uh, so we got out there, we celebrated. The mayor, who's gonna be speaking at the Cal Bike Summit, uh, cut the ribbon on the project. You can see Chris in the background on her phone tweeting about what an exciting project this is. And we got out there to celebrate the brand new protected bike lanes on Telegraph Avenue. And the city did a, a six month follow-up study which all projects that are super important should do uh, to see how the project is working, compare the, the data from before. And we learned a lot of things. One, more people are biking on the street, more people are walking on the street. Safety has improved significantly. Traffic is flowing fine. And it's also flowing much slower. The average speed on the street, this is a street, like I said, probably similar to Sunset Boulevard in many ways. The average speed is 17 miles an hour. Raise your hand if you live on a major arterial street in the state of California, where the average speed is eight miles per hour below the speed limit. Uh, it's a much safer street. And the good news is sales at the businesses went up. They went up because of the bike lane, right? Actually, we don't know that, but sales went up. And at times they went up even more than sales went up in other business districts in Oakland. So overall sales went up, at least for the three years after the project went in. 
And then the pandemic hit and things did change at that point. But the news was good. But the news wasn't all good. We had cars parking in the protected bike lanes because the protected bike lanes were largely painted, as you see here. There wasn't a curb put in, no physical changes to keep the cars out of the bike lane. Trucks were parking in the bike lane. The city did come back and put in these really flimsy flex posts, if you will, that you see there. And those immediately got annihilated. And then they came in and put in uh, planter boxes, these dark gray planter boxes. They put one in beginning and end of each block on both sides of the street. They didn't attach them to the street. So cars actually learned, drivers learned they could, with their car, move these things out of the way. And they ended up in the parking spaces. They ended up in the bike lanes and they were kind of a mess. And the city just took them out, and moved them over to another project. And then these, they put in the Zikla boarding islands with the repaving project. And those proved to be a little problematic. It was the East Bay's first Zikla boarding islands. And we learned a lot about Zikla boarding islands. We learned, and Berkeley also learned this as well, we're not gonna do any more Zikla boarding islands, no, no offense to Zikla, but we're gonna do what you see on the right here. Is the city's just gonna build the bus boarding island using cement. Uh, Berkeley made the same decision. So the photo on the right is Telegraph Avenue further up the street towards Berkeley in the Temescal district. It was a later project that came on and they built these bus boarding islands that perhaps many of your cities have. But the Zeklas were problematic for many reasons. So cars were parking in the bike lanes. The, there was no physical protection. The Zeklas weren't working. And the district was getting very frustrated because the bike lanes weren't working as intended. And pedestrians were reporting they weren't comfortable crossing the street. Many pedestrians still weren't comfortable crossing the street because of the floating parking that's in the street. And right about the end of 2019, three and a half years into the project, sales in the district started going down. And they started attributing that to the, the change in the street. And they wanted the street put back the way it was. We managed to push back against that, at least initially, and got the city to put in the, the fatter bollards that you see here. The city was gonna paint some more striping on the street to make it clear. And they were gonna paint purple as well to kind of make it clear where you, where you define the parking bays, but they ended up not doing the, the, the purple part. But they did this part and the district, it even infuriated the district even more because they, they hold an event uh, first Fridays, beginning of every month, and vendors are out in the street, and you can see these posts that got put in, and you can see the, the curb stops that also got put in to help keep the parked cars in place. Uh, they were concerned that this event wouldn't be able to happen successfully with all these things in the street. I think it's turned out since then that we've learned that it's fine. These posts are out there today and the car stops are there and people are setting up and things are fine. But at the time, the business district was very upset that these posts went in to mess up their first Fridays. So the council member, and Chris, this is where I'll, I'll turn things over to you to, to provide some update. The council member then said, I've had it with this project. The district has had it with the project. We want the protected bike lanes removed and to go back to buffered bike lanes. And, I, and we want the community to thoroughly redesign this project as they see fit, not as the bike walk advocates see fit. And so that started a, a total review of the project with the goal to make it an equitable project. Kono has all kinds of businesses, but they have a lot of family owned businesses, uh, less successful businesses, and they wanted to make sure this project was working for all businesses, not just uh, some of the businesses or not just for the business leadership. And so that's when Chris and I got re-engaged in the project, if you will, to work with the community to figure out what can make this project an equitable project. And it was the first time in my experience where the city was very intentional. We want this project to be equitable. What should it look like? And Bike East Bay and Walk Open, Bike Open, we welcomed that opportunity because it's not always how we think about our projects. Uh, so Chris, let me turn it over to you. Uh, and then I'll just wrap up after a couple of minutes and we'll take some questions. Sure, thanks, Dave. Um, that was a great summary of the project 
to date. Um, I, I think that um, what was important was really significant was that the city already had commitments towards equitable um, implementation of um, walking and bicycling and transportation infrastructure. So it wasn't hard to get the conversation to that level. The harder part of the conversation was dispelling any um, uh, sense that really walking and bicycling advocates were not from the community. I think that was the first thing that we needed to um, dispel. Um, and granted, you know, there are lots of walking bicycling advocates who are not going to be from the community, but we have a commitment to be the um, megaphone for our community members. And that actually took on a life of its own because it was really important for us to demonstrate that um, we were speaking um, from the truth that we were hearing on the ground. Um, the other aspect was uh, working with the city's uh, Department of Race and Equity, formulating some sort of survey that would yield meaningful information. And this is where I would say things kind of fell apart. Um, we you know, we really sat around the table having very intentional conversations about who, whose voices need um, to be elevated the most. Um, they're usually not the same people who are around the table talking about walking or bicycling. Um, they're usually not people who have time to have meetings in the middle of the day with the Department of Transportation. Um, and, you know, none of us really had a, a comprehensive pulse on what um, the, our most important stakeholders um, actually um, had, um, what their concerns really were about. And we spent a lot of time developing surveys, actually didn't really deploy those surveys at all, um, because we actually were starting to um, see you know splinter groups of surveys and businesses putting up their own surveys and data collection of commentary here and there was um it wasn't going to help um uh push the conversation um to the level where um we felt comfortable about what was being represented by responses from the various surveys so we can go into great detail on that but i won't do too much, but what ended up happening, I would say that the council members actually stepped up and they really started to um, question, you know, what, who are the vulnerable populations um, that we really need to focus on? And um, actually, uh, there were very, very meaningful conversations that actually happened at the council level that was I would say it was really important for um, every council member's um, district resident to reach out to them, to tell them directly uh, what their concerns were. It couldn't come directly from walking or bicycling advocates. Um, and that is part of you know, the, the role of advocacy groups like WOBO and Bikey Space. Like we need to really empower our community members to um, reach out to some of the decision makers. Um, on their own and um, really, you know, sort of um, building a wider base of, of conversation than what was actually happening um, on the ground. And, um, and I would say the council members were really pointed. They um, um, picked up on the fact that um, the most vulnerable community members are also the ones who take transit and Transit was the surprise, um, I would say, element of this conversation that I actually didn't expect to be so um, um, significant, but really having a focus on vulnerable po populations being the ones who probably take transit the most. Um, and community members also came out and um, recorded videos of themselves using uh, the bikeways um, and talking about how their kids um, use the roadways. And um, I thought that that contributed more, a higher quality and more impactful um, story for our council members to use to make their ultimate decision to keep the project 
um, with protected bike lanes. So, Dave, I'll hand that back to you after that. Yeah. No. Thanks, Chris. So just to, just to wrap up, you know, we hope to have a better understanding of what makes an equitable street safety project. And we did learn a lot, but we're, we're certainly not in a position to tell you, here's how Oakland does equitable street safety projects. We didn't learn that from this project. Our volunteers were able to raise some issues about who's using the street, who's walking, who's biking. We did, our volunteers did go talk to businesses. Dave Schneider actually was one of those volunteers to learn that many of them actually supported the bikeway and safe bikeways. They just had other issues about either parking or access uh, for their vehicles or loading that from our perspective, it could be worked out with the protected bike lanes. So we've got, and you can see here, some of our volunteers shopping at local businesses, going to talk to businesses that support the project. And, you know, like Chris said, the, the council did vote uh, to install the protected bike lanes permanently. And that project is actually gonna be happening this year with concrete curves and concrete bus porting islands fully funded. But we've got other projects coming up in Oakland, like 14th Street downtown and the Grand Avenue mobility plan. And Oakland's very much intentionally looking at how to make these equitable projects. And we do wish we would have learned more from Telegraph than we did. Uh, we learned some, some things and some good things and raised some good questions, but uh, we do have a race and equity department that provides leader on, leadership on this. And so we are looking forward to working with them more closely on future projects. With that, Dave, I'll, I'll wrap up and eager to take questions. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we have just like uh, 10 minutes is about it. So <clears throat> I would encourage you to put your questions in the chat and hopefully some of the presenters will be able to get to them if not within the hour uh, afterward um, if you have a question that is best expressed verbally uh, raise your hand and i will uh, try to see that um, that's under the reactions button at the bottom of your screen there's a button called raise hand uh, aida you're first i will you will have to unmute. Hi, thank you. I just came back. I live in LA and I just came back from a trip to Berkeley and I was really pleased with all the uh, safety features for bicycling up there. And I saw some kind of bicycling advocacy group and I just wanna know, um, having uh, been a native to LA <laughs> and, and seeing, you know, Sunset for All having to do all their own groundwork to do these activities. Uh, what have you seen as um, being in the Bay the most effective advocacy strategy has it been like producing like uh, an organization, um, getting people on the ground, uh, showing interest? Because I feel like in LA, there's just so much pushback from the community. It's kind of hard to do both, but, and also getting the attention from council members um, in terms of instigating change, uh, especially when people are getting injured or killed. Um, so I would like to know, like, what are the strategies you've seen most effective for advocacy? Thanks. And Dave, happy to start that one. Chris, I'll hand it over to you as well. Two strategies. One is Bike East Bay does work very intentionally with business districts, and we don't often go up against a business district for a street safety change project. Kono became a little bit, Telegraph became a little bit problematic there at the end where we were going up against the business district. But we got their support initially for that project. And we're working with other business districts for their support too. So we don't often go against them. And I know that's not the same story with other walk bike coalitions around the country. Sometimes you just want to outnumber them and make, make the safety improvements. The other thing we've, well, we've done, I'll say the other thing that's happened is we've gotten a lot of supportive city council members elected. And a lot of them and, and we, we're 501c3, we're not doing that, but it's happening. And, you know, aside from our 501c3 status, we, we're trying to support that type of thing, but get walk bike transit advocates on city councils. It makes a huge difference. It's making a huge difference in Berkeley. It's making a huge difference in Emeryville and Alameda. Uh, it's not working everywhere because we don't have supportive council members everywhere, but it, that's one of the go-to strategies here in the East Bay is become the decision maker that 
can make the change that you want to see. Uh, Chris? I, I'll just add that, um, you know, events like Sclavia and other Open Streets events are a really great way to bring people, uh, um, decision makers, to the site to have them really experience what things can be like. I think that's one thing. Um, the other thing I would note is, and Dave, you didn't put this in your presentation about Telegraph, but we actually um, did a pop-up um, bike lane um, on a bike to work day with then Mayor Jean Kwan to show her what this protected bike lane um, could be like. And I would say that that sort of changed people's perspective a little bit in terms of just being able, being able to imagine what things could be like rather than theoretically, this is what you know it would feel like. Um, and I think that those are, um, are really important experiences to put out there um, and, and getting you know, uh, people in elected offices or commissions. We have a Bicyclists and Pedestrian Advisory Commission that, is, that plays a fairly um, important role in our world. Um, and don't forget um, uh, those, uh, the electeds on uh, transportation or transit commissions because they are um, equally, I mean, they can um, move a lot of mountains if you have, you, you build a coalition that is bigger and broader than something that is very, very specific to walking and bicycling. Great, so we have until 1.30. I was mistaken to say that this ends at one o'clock and that's a relief because uh, this is a great conversation. So please keep the questions coming. I'll see you if you put your uh, hand up. I want to address a question from uh, Sharon Pikarski. Um, she asks how these projects are funded, and I think I can answer on behalf of Telegraph Avenue, which is to say it's an active transportation program grant. Um, but LA is different. So um, can you explain to us how you are funding that project? Uh, Shockingly, actually, I remember from your presentation a minute ago that you're funding a piece of it, the initial design, through private money. But how, how is it going to be built? Um, I'll, I'll just take that question quickly. So um, the initial engineering, so like the, it was 30% design was crowdsourced um, and is in progress right now. Um, we... If, if anybody's interested, we have a slide on all of the um, state and federal funds that are now available for active transportation. A big one, like um, Dave said, is the active transportation program um, at the state level, um, as well as there's some other um, funding that's available potentially through Metro um, and also potentially through the new um, federal um, a competitive grant program that will be soon, hopefully soon available from the, the latest infrastructure um, package, which is for, for safe streets, um, for safe street projects. But yeah, I think that, I, I think that the funding, I like to, to say that the funding actually, I think for Los Angeles, getting to everybody agreeing that we should go after grant funding is a challenge. Um, I don't think it's this project, we think kind of scores off the charts in terms of all the eligibility that all these other these grant programs have. But I think the challenge is getting everybody, um, the community and politicians kind of aligned to say, yes, we want to go after these grants. We want this project. Um, great, thank you. Is anybody, I don't see, I see no, how can nobody be raising their hand right now? Um, I saw a few in the comments or in the chat. Here's a question uh, from Shulem. In Sunset for All, how is bike parking incorporated? Uh, uh, Derek, yeah, you? yeah, question for Derek or Terrence. Um, bike parking at the moment, we have not incorporated it. So that will be a part of the overall vision with the engineer once we get to the point that right now he's re right now he's redrawing the corridor of what is possible within the streets and then we'll be able to focus on things that I can say that through doing presentations to local businesses and local developers and all of these things and I also just really want to quickly make a point about equity is that 
due to what the local council member metric is for approving this project, it's about the businesses trading parking for protected bike lanes. They'd only be losing about, about keeping spaces over 3.2 miles. So it's very minimal parking loss, but that's the metric that's been put in front of us. So you keep hearing us talking about businesses because that's what this portion of the campaign is about. But we are also trying to do equitable outreach simultaneously. But in one of our business presentations, a developer uh, along the route that just had a seven story building approved actually just added a ton of bike parking. So excited about our project and went back to his partners and said, there's gonna be a major bike corridor here. We wanna have as much bike parking as possible. And we want to get behind this group because, uh, and they've been introducing us to other businesses because people are very excited about it. Here's another question from the chat. Uh, Christine Schindler asks, how have you energized and grown your bike walk groups? Uh, we have a sturdy core group, but need more perspectives, younger folks, et cetera. Um, I'll answer it for uh, Sunset for All. Um, uh, this is Avital. I'm with Sunset for All again. Um, really, uh, I actually met Terrence and Derek um, because I went to, I got hit riding to work and I was like, this sucks. There must be a better way. Um, and I found a Los Angeles Bicycle Coalition um, uh, it's a community group meeting, and they there was this there was this program at the time that was for um, bike ambassadors, community bike ambassadors, and it was actually led by a really amazing um, facilitator, Jesse, that worked for LACBC at the time, um, and that's where I met uh, you know my my two colleagues that are on the call, but also a whole host of other people who were there like me who had you know walking or biking in Los Angeles and thought it could be better, and they wanted to do something about it, and we kind of a bunch of us got together um, and we continued actually meeting um, even after the group kind of uh, uh, lost, the LACBC actually wasn't leading anymore. We actually met in a coffee shop once a month on the first Monday um, and we would meet. We met for what Terrence and Derek like two years, three, I think like two years every Monday at a coffee shop um, kind of working this idea through um, how working our strategy um, bringing new people into the fold. So it really, it really is about, I think the bike coalition kind of set the stage of creating these groups that they help facilitate community members who want to make a difference, but also let those community members say, okay, this was for a central Los Angeles um, bike ambassador group. And so we came together saying, hey, we all live in this central area in Los Angeles. We all want to improve bike, biking and walking what is a project we think kind of rises to the top that will have the biggest impact? And that's how we, we kind of actually made a long laundry list of projects and Sunset kind of rose to the top. There were other projects on the list as well. So I think that figuring out how you kind of, how bike coalitions kind of um, help facilitate like ragtag community groups to kind of rise up and organize. Um, so, and that, and that I think is, I don't know, Eli, if you want to talk a little bit about kind of the thought of how you how you duplicate this process kind of moving forward. Sure, happy to jump in. And I think, um, you know, what's so exciting about Sunset for All is that it really was an organic uh, movement of community leaders, community members who from their lived experience decided this is this shall not stand. And so we were just um, essentially trying to set, set the, like Avital said, set uh, uh, the, the context for these conversations to happen. And um, we're all too excited to see that this conversation continued to flow even long after Jesse went to back to grad school. Um, and so we actually we entered the conversation later on when it was time for actual fundraising to take place. And, and that's why we are serving as the fiscal sponsor to uh, to help manage the you know the bank accounts and make sure that all the the support is is there from our our coalition to support these community leaders. But really, it's it's led by the community. And I think you know again, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, our 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 theory of change is to somehow create a playbook uh, and a training series to capture the lessons of Sunset for All, and not in a cut and paste type of way, but sort of understand what are the ingredients necessary. Um, what are the lessons that we've learned along the way with Sunset for All uh, that will be uh, easily portable to other uh, community-led projects throughout the county? Um, so uh, it, it is a, in LA, it's definitely like a, a radical um, 
uh, innovative approach. But uh, th as Derek talked about in his presentation, we got so many people donating small dollars. I think the average donation was less than 50 bucks to show that, that folks really want to vote with their pocketbooks, that this mattered. And, and that, that was a validation of our process. And so again, we, we're the wind in the sails of this amazing group of community organizers. Um, you know, I think, I think the lessons that we are learning from Bike East Bay in terms of how to make sure that we uh, reach beyond the business leaders and we make sure that we uh, create the same sort of safe spaces for community members, uh, residents, uh, people who use the, the corridor uh, for commuting, uh, that their voices are also very much heard in an equitable way is, is, a, is a thing that I think LACBC will also bring that, 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 that layer of support uh, to make sure that that happens. So um, our model is really to listen to the community members who have raised this issue up and this specific street up and then to arm them with the, with the tools that they need to succeed. Thanks, Eli. A uh, question from JCO about how the driving public in Oakland reacted to the loss of a traffic lane on Telegraph. I mean, I, I see the, the usual whining, but I'm curious if, if you, Chris, or Dave have some insights that we can learn from. Uh, yeah, it was large. Non issue, Dave. This part of Telegraph, it's coming into downtown Oakland, and the end of it is actually more of a plaza type space. You'll get to see that at the Cal Bike Summit. So the traffic volumes are super low. It's a busy arterial as you get further north and head into Berkeley. And so we chose this stretch because the volumes were lower and it wasn't going to create congestion issues. And so we've heard very little. Chris, you can share your feedback you've heard on congestion. We've definitely heard from drivers who have to park out in the street away from the curb. They hate that, they hate it, they hate it, they hate it. And we've heard it on other streets, other projects as well. And so one thing Bike East Bay is looking for is how are other cities doing their first or doing protected bike lanes on the cheap and not making drivers feel like they're out in the street as vulnerable as, as you may feel bicycling out on the street, parking out on the street. That's been our, our big pushback on Telegraph app. I don't have much to add to that other than the fact that I, you know, I actually thought we would have just a storm of um, complaints about the lack of parking because that's usually what stalls some of our projects. But honestly, I don't think it's about parking at all. Um, at the end of the day, it's more, uh, I think drivers who, are confused. And this is where I would just put in a plug for um, go whole hog on the, the best infrastructure um, and do it quickly. Um, because uh, as we were piloting little things, doing paint and flex posts instead of the real concrete stuff, um, and the longer the pilot project goes, people think that that's the real deal and that's what they're gonna get in perpetuity. Um, and I think that the lesser um, form of the project always, um, it, it disincentivizes, it, it lets people down. And people are like, this is what I, I, I just um, advocated for. Um, and, and then it also confuses drivers. Um, so that was probably what I heard more of rather than I can't find any parking because, you know, who knows? Um, there wasn't that much parking to begin with on Telegraph. Um, so, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, Chris, I'll just add the business district when they wanted the protected bike lanes removed, they wanted to keep the road diet. They wanted to go to buffered bike lanes. They weren't asking that the bike lanes be removed entirely. So that was something of a success. And so the road diet was really never kind of in question. Thanks all. Um, I see we've got Warren Wells had his hand raised patiently there. I want you to go ahead and chime in, Warren. Sure, thanks a lot and great presentations to everybody. Um, a couple of questions about the uh, the Sunset for All project. I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, the process of, of finding a consultant to, to do the engineering designs. I assume it's like 30% conceptual designs. Did you find, did you have someone lined up before you 
raise the money? How did you how did you set a um, like get a cost estimate and set the amount of um, the the budget for that for that crowdfunding process? Um, and um, did all the money that you raised go toward that, or were you, you did some of the money raised like go toward go toward helping with outreach and stuff? I'm just kind of interested in that the the process around that. Thanks so much. Avi Tall had to head out back to her job. Do you want me to take this one, Derek? I'll just go, oh, yeah, go I'll just go with it. Um, so so back at the beginning of the process, um, we you know, we didn't want to be making recommendations about what the design of the street should be. We wanted professionals to be doing that. And so from the first coffee meetings, we were shaking the trees at the Los Angeles Department of Transportation to find out what is possible. And we were also lucky that CD13, this council district. I swear, like every transportation planner and a half the engineers in town live in this council district because it's like former streetcar suburbs, you know, suburbs just three miles from downtown. It's like tailor made for every single urban planner who wants to live here. Um, and so we were able to talk to various um, transportation professionals to be like, what is possible with 76 feet? And then once we found out that there would have to be a, a road diet if we were going to put protect lanes on both sides. Um, it was only possible talking to political leaders, talking to members of the community. There's just no support for that, for road dieting Sunset Boulevard, especially outside Dodger Stadium. Um, we just don't have the political support for that. So that made it about a bi-directional parking protected bike lane. And we actually, Rock Miller, who's this incredible sweetheart, I don't know if I, those of you who know him know this to group. Um, Whenever we talked to like, uh, you know, people at um, Caltrans and at LA Dot, they were all like, you should talk to Rock Miller, you should talk to Rock Miller. And he's the former president of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. He's designed some of the best bikeways in North America. Everybody said, you got to talk to Rock Miller. And so I was like very nervous when we reached out to Rock Miller that he wasn't going to talk to us. And he couldn't have been sweeter or more. He shared so much and was so generous with his knowledge about what is possible and what might be possible. Then after the two years of COVID, you know, we did outreach during COVID, but it's very hard to talk about bikes when small businesses are struggling to stay alive. And we didn't want to be insensitive to that. So we just tried to support the business community instead of asking them to support us. And that was the bike meeting where we would just we would just choose a business along the corridor, send out a hashtag, support these people on this day. And we'd usually have about, you know, two to four dozen customers show up for them that day. <clears throat> so during that, at the end of this two years, we had lost a lot of the momentum and that we had going prior to COVID. So then the decision amongst the leadership of Sunset for All was like, how do we regain the momentum? And how do we get over this political obstacle, which is you know, the city controls the carrot, the carrot of, you know, we were talking about, I'm sorry, excuse me, the chicken and the egg. The city controls when LA Dot is going to make those engineering plans. How do we maybe get around that? And at the same time, people who donate are then going to be that much more motivated to be volunteering and walk, talking to businesses and walking the corridor. And so that's where this decision to crowdfund was. We reached out to Rock to get a number. And we also reached out to like a couple other people informally. And Rock is semi-retired now, so he's doing it for free. Um, his, his, his partners at GTS Engineering, or his, 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 his colleagues at GTS Engineering, are doing the literal plans. Rock is designing it. They're putting the plans to paper, and it, they're doing it at their cost because it's such an incredibly important corridor. Everybody says it's it's the most, like it's, it's we call it the, what, the existential gap in the mobility network. Without sunset, that there's no mobility net. We can't. So Rock was excited about the possibility of having a legacy project. Everyone else rec recognized that it was one of the most important corridors in the entire region. And so everybody pulled together to get this done. Um, we raised a little bit more than 60,000 and we have used some of those funds towards outreach materials, such as those really fancy business brochures that we have. And um, our flat happies and I'm going to be making a little bit of t-shirts. And some of that is the LA County Bicycle Coalition pitching in to also add extra resources on top because they're just freaking awesome. Very cool. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, really appreciate it all. And as a former resident of LA, I appreciate all the work you guys are doing there, making it. I, I left LA because it was too hard to bike there. So appreciate all, all the work you guys are doing. Well, well, when we come back, Warren, uh, hopefully we'll be able to take a, a ride along the corridor. And I just say, so in terms of like a little bit of mechanics, Sunset for All uh, uh, is a fiscal sponsor -y, or we are, we're the fiscal sponsor. So we do take an admin fee. It's, it's nominal. Um, and it's, 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 but it's just a way for us to make sure that we cover some of our costs. And so that's just part of the deal. 
Um, but I, I would say that, you know, it, it really, in terms of attracting Rock Miller, it, 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 it had everything to do with the tenacity and the, and the passion of the community uh, led process. I mean, it really had to do with uh, Abital speaking from the lived experience that she had uh, uh, in, in the crash that she suffered. It had to do with Terrence being a, a bike dad LA, you know, going out and riding with his kids fearlessly, but, but, but realizing that it was not um, really a, a enough of an opportunity or an option for most people uh, that 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 has swayed that has swayed uh, all these great leaders to come in and these designers to come in and, and be a part of the movement. Uh, thanks, all. We've got a question from Rich Oberleitner in the chat. His question is: If there are any updates on the status of public events such as Pedal Fest, Sunday Open Streets? Social rides, rock the bike, music festivals for the year 2022. And Rich, if you're still on the call, maybe um, if you had any other clarifying questions or more info, you could chime in. Well, basically, with uh, things as they are, a lot of public events have been closing down. And I think the thing that propels a lot of our projects really is bike culture and getting more seats, more people on bikes of all ages and all uh, abilities. Once that happens, then we can get more of an impetus for me. That basically, Copenhagenized California, if you know what I mean by that. Um, Denmark and, and all these great international possibilities. But the American mindset is still car oriented. And I guess one thing will feed another. But there used to be some very great... Um, uh, you might say uh, events and festivals that bring out a lot of young people or people of all ages to the possibility of cycling, like Pedal Fest in um, in Jack London Square and uh, Rock the Bike events and bike music festivals and bike movies and so on and so forth. Um, really generating an impetus in bike culture and the fun and fitness and the freedom of what cycling is about. And it's uh, what I'm hearing, this is all great, these projects. I love them. And I know many of us that are continuous cyclists really rely on it, but we're still a minority. And it would be great to become a majority. And maybe e-bikes and senior trikes might add on to that. But I guess what I'm asking now, in this year, uh, are there things slated to really promote cycling in California and in our areas, like open streets, like the Wobo? movements um that we had here in the bay area the fantastic even the bike parties are great but linking up a little bit more of um you know the possibility of politics to these events and press so that not everybody just gets an enjoyment on the whole thing and then forgets about it for a year but actually sees wow we can have this more coming together and cycling and really enjoying the whole experience of it and making those streets safer in Telegraph and in LA and so on and so forth. Big question, I know, big, <laughs> big thing, but I'm curious if those events are slated and if there's any movement to those projects. If so, I'd like to get involved in personally as well. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. I'll put a plug in. May 20th is Bike to Wherever Day. And uh, Wobo in coordination with the uh, city's Oak Dot. Uh, we're trying to plan for a pretty significant event that is um, going to be a little bit different than the traditional uh, bike to work day um, kind of event. We'll have more to announce, but you know, I would say these kinds of events that you just mentioned, Rich, are very expensive, um, and for small organizations to be to play host to it is very difficult. Um, but Oak Dot has actually um, put in their uh, neighborhood bike plan um, a commitment to supporting more of these um, types of events. Now the question is um, how and for whom and where and when and you know the implementation part. But so that's there's some planning to, yet to be done. Um, but. I would say during COVID, I saw more on social media informal group rides than any other time that I've um, experienced. Um, and they, there are kid-oriented rides. The mini flyers are out, out there covering um, West Oakland. Scraper bikes are still doing their uh, weekly thing. So it's not, I would say that it 
doesn't take formal events to energize the, uh, the grassroots um, because people are already doing that. Um, but I think the missing piece, the missing link is the conversation that says, that connects people from what they're enjoying out there as a group to what can be done um, every day. And that um, is where maybe some of the less vi uh, visible work is happening on the ground uh, with Bike Bay and Wobo. But I personally have done Ciclavia a couple of times and, and I've lived in Los Angeles and it's incredible. And I can't imagine like any other kind of event that could have as much of a, um, a, of a I, I guess, um, advocacy uh, energy than something like that. Uh, maybe I'll just jump in I, and I put something in the chat to what Chris just shared. I think, you know, we've also been following public health guidelines in LA to make sure that we're in accordance with uh, just keeping people healthy and safe during the pandemic. Uh, we instituted a, a virtual uh, self-guided um, community rides that we, we converted all our Sunday fun day rides to those types of rides. Uh, had pretty good participation. I agree with Chris that folks were riding on their own and riding in community. Uh, in small ways, but uh, totally also recognize that something the scale of Ciclovia as really a car holiday in LA is 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 a pretty compelling thing that that just uh, captures people's imagination, as only the lived experience of getting on a bike in community can do. Um, they haven't actually uh, released their schedule for this year, which is late. Usually, Ciclovia announces like I mean right at the beginning of the year. So we're still waiting, um, knowing that they're working hard to to put together their 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 slate of rides. Um, but, uh, you know, it's tough. It's tough right now to organize at that scale, um, as, as important as it is. So I'll just add one other thing just to give credit to Sunset for All. I, I just need to mention that um, Avital and Terrence and Derek mentioned our coffee walks, which are by design walks and not rides, because we want to we want to really show the multimodal impact of something like Sunset for All. And so those coffee walks uh, are an opportunity for people to come out, um, t walk the corridor and, and, and envision the, the, the potential future or the future that we're going to make real. Um, so, so we're doing our, our small level sort of in-person uh, events. Uh, we're starting to like scale them up. But it, again, it, we want to make sure that we're, we're uh, doing it responsibly and thoughtfully, uh, depending on what's going on uh, with the community health uh, due to the pandemic. So look out for our coffee walks. There's there more coming up. Great, thank you everyone. Um, we've only got a few minutes left here. I see one more hand raised. So we'll go ahead and uh, call on Eric's question and then um, I will pass it over to Dave. Thanks, uh, it's good to be here. I'm uh, I'm uh, on Sunset for All, so um, I'm a volunteer with them. So uh, it's good to be here. Thanks for the presentation. So this comes to my question. I wanna piggyback on what Rich was kind of wrestling with about how do we get kind of more of this done uh, quicker. Um, so my question to the to everyone here is um, outreach is about outreach and 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 creating um, a critical need. Um, so I was studying a lot about what they did in Europe around the kin um, around the children murder or the children death with fatalities. And I was wanting to ask the group are we all reaching out to like organized labor, especially teacher unions, because there's a lot of schools. So there's an overcross between kid fatalities and teachers at schools. Are we, um, are we like reaching out to the sunrise movement? Cause there's an overlap between reducing carbon and, and, and doing this and, and so many other um, groups uh, that would be on our site. And finally on with this, why Sunset for All is so successful is we are an engaged community. I live in the community and that little movie that was shown about that bike, that's my bike route every day to work. I work at Kaiser, so there you go. Um, so yeah, that's my question about this engagement and how deep are we getting and how, how can we start to like imagine other types of coalitions we can work with, thanks. Uh, Eric, maybe I'll quickly respond and I see that one or more people on, from Transformer on the call. 
Uh, we've been working with labor. A lot of the groups that we work with are working with labor to support transit right now, more transit funding, uh, more support for transit. Uh, transit's facing some serious issues in the next couple of years. And so in, I think in terms of you know bringing labor into our advocacy work right now, it's right now bikey space priority is to support transit. And we really, we do look to transform in their leadership on that issue here in the Bay Area. Um, we haven't connected with labor, although I'd love to, and I think the Sunrise Movement's a great idea. We've been going mostly through supporters introducing us to other orgs, such as, you know, the Bike Kitchen this morning just introduced me to the head librarian at Quenga Library. Um, we have done presentations for local schools, but each school is its own ecosystem, so it's just time consuming. We get an introduction from a parent, and then we go from there and we try to make them aware of the, the, the safety um, the safety aspects of the campaign. And we also have a great letter of support from the Safe Routes Partnership, which really helps us with schools. And that might be a good tip. So the Safe Routes Partnership California is the premier Safe Routes to School organization in California. And they wrote us this incredible letter that's really useful with school outreach. Because as soon as you can say like the number one, you know, Safe Routes to School organization in the state says this is about the project, it's very easy to get parents on board, PTAs and local principals. Well, uh, one more question. I think we have enough time. So um, Alexa, why don't you go ahead? Hey, y'all. Thanks for really great presentations. I'm calling in from Santa Rosa in the North Bay, and we're really a, a bit behind you uh, bigger cities, and we're just getting started. And I'm just wondering um, for advice, is it better to try to start pushing for a complete network right from the beginning or to pick a few marquee stretches like sunset or you know um you know a, a particular street and try to get that done and then build a network out from there does any any insight on that i definitely have some insights on that it's hard to build a network if you can do that yeah i would say do that but we haven't been able to do that in the East Bay. We don't have a single city and really not even a single community in the East Bay that has a network yet. And I've been doing this now for 25 years. So if you can do it, uh, great, that would be my advice. But I would start with where people are walking and biking. So whatever you do, you have the most, you have the highest chance of having a successful project that people will see and go, okay, yes, that's, that's good, that's better. I support that. The challenge there is it's got to connect to something or people aren't going to use it. So what is that right balance? But I would definitely start where people are walking and biking. Typically that's here in the Bay Area, that's transit or schools are two of the, you know, the places we usually start uh, and take it from there. But, you know, I love your vision of a network. Uh, we're just not, I don't think here in the, even the, in the Bay Area, we're ready to commit to building a network just like that. Uh, I would I would join in 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 what is uh, Dave is sharing. I mean, in, in our in our circumstance, we have a mobility plan 2035 that was passed uh, almost unanimously by the council members back in 2015. To date, uh, I think the number is only seven percent of it, uh, or three percent of it has has been has been created in the last seven years. So it's like 90 some odd miles out of over 3,000 miles that was that's in the plan. And you can look it up if you want the mobility plan 2035 for Los Angeles. So yeah, I think I totally agree that you know we we it's ideal to have a coherent uh, systems wide uh, plan in place, um, uh, but I do think you got to go where where the people are and and um, and and really leverage that lived experience with a project like Telegraph or Sunset uh, Sunset for All. So that's kind of our sense of it as well. Yeah, I I would I agree with both sentiments, um, although. Um, I would say every town, every city is a little different. Um, if it makes sense and to have some sort of network 
um, and you can get a captive group of supporters um, at, you know, from the outset, it might not be a bad idea. And for people to understand, well, this is just this little, you know, three block area, what does this really mean um, in the great, greater scheme of things? Um, but I don't know Santa Rosa as well. So um, it is very contextual. Very quickly, I'll just add that I think at the end of the day, the neighborhood network is going to be the backbone of much of LA for a long time to come. And that's why we're trying to choose those really important strategic gaps where the neighborhood network can't take care of it. And um, I'm just going to add one more thing, which is, as I, most of you know me as LA Bike Dad, if you know me at all, um, if you aren't designing your neighborhood network for nine-year-olds, then you're not designing a neighborhood network. And so if these lanes can't be used A to A, and there isn't traffic calming in the neighborhood network, I don't think it's going to be successful. There has to be traffic calming, and we're working very hard with LA DOT to push them because they think simply calling something a neighborhood network and then adding uh, a stoplight to get you across an arterial does it. But because Waze, I don't know about you, Waze has claimed most of our usable neighborhood network streets, there needs to be diversion and traffic. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Dave Snyder for a quick wrap up. Great, thank you, Kevin. And uh, especially thank you, Kevin. You uh, have struggled with uh, unusual technical challenge today and you've uh, calmly led us through. I appreciate that. And <clears throat> so I've used Stephanie Alfaro in the background. Thank you to the Cal Bike team for everything that you do, making these uh, uh, awesome symposia. And the speakers, uh, you all inspire me. Derek, uh, Terrence, Avital, uh, you, you, uh, you are why that I have been involved in bike advocacy for so long. It's so inspiring to see that kind of work uh, also uh, here in my hometown of Oakland with Dave and Chris and the many others that have worked on that. So thank you. And uh, Eli, the, the support of the Sunset for All project and the, the role that the LACBC plays in being uh, leaders and supporters, but also supporting leadership uh, is, is a great model, I think, for the whole state. And thank you uh, to everyone who's on this call. About 100 people uh, have, have joined this call. You uh, hopefully will take these uh, lessons and these stories and be inspired by them. Uh, hopefully, you will uh, consider coming to the summit. Like I said, today and today only, there's uh, the discount, the early bird discount of 295 bucks use that code. Stephanie, could you please just add that back to the uh, chat so people can see that code. Um, I hope you can come to the summit and I hope I get to see you in about seven weeks. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you to uh, everyone for your support of bike advocacy. Thanks everybody. Thank you all, have a great day.